Brewing Network. My name is Justin Crosley. I'm with the Brewing Network, and I'm lucky enough to get to do this each year and sit with legends on the stage and talk with you guys about beer. We're going to allow you to ask questions tonight, too. we got a microphone set up, so if you've got questions for any of us, uh, please be prepared to do that. What we're talking about today is 30 years of the Great American Beer Festival, which is a lot of years for a beer fest. You know, there's a lot of new ones coming up now, but 30 years for this festival is, is a pretty impressive number. And to do that with us today, we've got Ken Grossman from the Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. He's the founder of Sierra Nevada. And uh, yeah, he deserves that, absolutely. Thank you. And I wanted to clap for you, Ken, because you brought that sweet Volkswagen bus to pour beer from this year. I love that thing. Uh, we drove it out here. It was a slow trip, but we did make it. <laughs> yeah. You left last year to get here. <laughs> and then, of course, we've got Charlie Papazian, you know, who's the founder of, of this festival, and we call him the godfather of homebrewing. Yeah. We owe him a lot. We owe him a lot of uh, great beer, and, and a lot of hangovers are probably due to Charlie, too. And then everybody knows this sweet face down at the end from television and for a lot of years here at the GABF2, Jim Cook from the Boston Beer Company. Yeah. Always fun to be around. So, like I said, today we're going to talk about how the beer festival started and how it's evolved over the years and got this wonderful beer in your hands. And, and to do that, I, I think there's no one better to start with than Charlie, you know, who really started this thing as a home brewer. And it's turned into what it is today uh, over many years and a lot of hard work and a lot of good beer. Charlie, why don't you tell us a little bit about how that very first uh, Great American Beer Festival came together? Yeah, it, it came together in 1981. The seeds were planted. Actually, before that, well, actually, it was 1981 that we had our home brewers conference in Boulder, Colorado, and it was there I met Michael Jackson, among other people, like Fred Eckhart and a few other uh, actual craft brewers, microbrewers in, in those early, early times. Um, in 1981, I went to England for my very first trip to Europe and Michael Jackson showed me around. I was invited to go to the Great British Beer Festival and it was there that I um, had the idea after roaming the halls for a few days, you know, this is a pretty cool thing, you know, a, a national beer festival celebrating, you know, a tradition that was British and, the, and that's what that beer festival is about. And I, and I was, it crossed my mind, I, I wondered whether we could ever pull off or do something called the Great American Beer Festival and celebrate what well, in 1981, 82 what was left of the the beer culture in in, in the United States and the and the beers that may have been brewing some interesting beers. I asked Michael Jackson that over a pint in his local pub and he said, "Well, that's a great idea. I'll support you any way I can, but where are you going to get the beers? Because there was a dearth of beers there. There was not much." much out there and at that time I was also discovering people like Ken who was, had, had started his brewery uh, shortly before that and you got to remember 1982 you almost have to be as old as I am or Ken and I and Jim that what the beer culture was like we had this idea of the Great American Beer Festival it took us about a year to get it together there's four guys on my living room floor pouring over books of American beer labels and trying to figure out which ones were still in business and who was possibly making some interesting beers. And we managed to invite most of the regional brewers, and it was through the two, through Tom Burns, who was the brewmaster at Boulder Beer at that point. He was also involved as a board of directors for the American Home Brewers Association. He had connections with the then Brewers Association of America, and, and they thought highly of him. So the thought of asking uh, America's oldest heritage brewers for 10 cases of beer for a beer festival that a bunch of home brewers wanted to throw in Boulder, Colorado was, I thought was pretty far-fetched, but somehow they had some kind of confidence or we lucked out and we, we, got, we got this beer and it was that the journey to Boulder was, went through tornadoes and crashes on the way and the beer didn't arrive, it was very stressful because the beer didn't really arrive until the day before the beer festival. It was supposed to arrive two weeks before the festival. And you got to remember, again, this, this, we weren't on the radar. There were no beer festivals that were celebrating American beer culture or American beer. 
in those times. There were beer festivals, but they were mostly beer festivals that celebrated a brand and was put on by a brewery. And so the whole idea of celebrating American beers was unique, and it was very unique for brewers from different companies to participate in an event together. That was pretty out there. But I guess we were naive. We didn't have a business plan. We didn't have financing. Um, we had volunteers. At that time, 1982, there were one and a half full-time equivalent people that were working for the American Home Brewers Association. I was working full-time on a part-time salary. And, and uh, it, two months before the beer festival, Daniel Bradford was hired as a marketing director for half-time. So he came on board February or March or March of 1982. So the beer festival was well underway, planning contracts. And, uh, you know, I, it wouldn't have happened unless that beer community that, that existed in Boulder, Colorado, and along the Front Range, the enthusiasts pulled together, all volunteering, trucking across the nation, refrigeration in some coolers in various parts of Boulder County, um, the, the, the 60 or 70 home brewers that volunteered a tremendous amount of time. And, um, you know, one of the most satisfying things about the, this 30 years later is that, you know, the efforts for all those people in those early years that put their heart and soul in wanting to make this thing work, that we're, we've gotten to 30. And, you know, that's one of the most heartening things for me is that, you know, for those people that put their heart and soul in it in the early days, that it did, we did make it work. Well, and thanks to them. I mean, I can't imagine a beer festival any other way now where there's not multiple breweries joined together. Uh, you know, just having one brand at a beer festival, it doesn't fit for me. And by the way, there's a lot of people, I think, here that don't remember when you couldn't just Google all the breweries in the country and then get on your mobile phone and ask them to be here, too. So the, the fact that you pulled out a book of beer labels to find out who was, you know, just a testament to how it's changed. And how many, just quickly, how many breweries were at the first one? Do you remember? There were about 22 breweries, 40 beers. Okay. And Pretty good. Con contrary to some of the reports in the media, it was not a microbrewers festival. There were only three microbrewers there at the very first one. It was Ken, uh, River City, Sierra Nevada, River City, Boulder Beer, and actually, you know, in terms of what we recognize as microbrewers now, Anchor Steam. But Anchor Steam had been around for a hundred years or so, and, and Chris Maytag and all those great folks there had uh, rejuvenated that brewery starting in 1965. And so, you know, they they were a staff, They had been a, they were an anomaly. They were a little bit different than the startups that were happening right around that time. But looking back, they were just as much a part of that microbrewery culture as the three startups that were at the festival. I was going to point out, I mean, back in 1980, there was only about 40 breweries left in the U.S., and that encompassed all the large ones as well as the small ones. So a uh, totally different time in the beer scene and the, the handful of smaller regional breweries that were still making something interesting was even smaller. So it was really just, just a, a few of those surviving. And, and that was actually after the, some of the earliest craft brewers had already gone out of business. Uh, New Albion had closed that year. So there was sort of a little peak and then a valley as far as the, the beer scene in the U.S. So now, Ken and, and the Sierra Nevada Brewing Company, you were at the very first Great American Beer Festival with Charlie. We were. So tell me about this phone call. Charlie calls you with this crazy idea. You're all the way in California. And you say, yeah, uh, sure, I'll drive out there. Um, I said, I, actually, I think I might have flown, but I said I'd come on out. Um, but actually, that very first festival was combined with uh, an early version of the Craft Brewers Festival, sort of a, a technical uh, a technical conference uh, where there were a lot of speakers from around the world. And so it, I was invited to speak at that conference as well and got to meet well, Michael Jackson and, and some other luminaries in the industry. Uh, a fellow who had opened the uh, chain of brew pubs in England uh, called the, the Firkin Chains, and so it was a, a really fun group to get together. And uh, we were also new and young in the industry. It was really actually a great time. To tell you how 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 new these ideas were, then there were people in the audience listening to David Bruce and the Firkin Chain of, of brew pubs in England, in London, that he had, and they were listening to this guy talking about brewing a beer and then serving it 
over the bar in your own brewery, you know, in a restaurant. And it, it was like, imagine that. You can make the beer and then sell it directly to the customer. What a, what a great idea. And that, you know, that was the reaction. I mean, that's how new these ideas were. And there were a lot of laws that had to change around the country before that was possible. But it happened, obviously. Okay, before we get to Jim, just real quick, the beer that you've got in your glass there is one of the Sierra Nevada uh, 30th anniversary beers. Right, this is a beer we released um, on our 30th anniversary last year, and this was one that uh, we did with Jack McAuliffe of the New Albion Brewery, and I, I understand Jack is supposed to be here uh, for the, the next day or two, so uh, he'll have a chance to see what he, he missed out on the, uh, the 30 years or so, actually more than 30 years that he's been out of the industry. So. Uh, a lot of what's happened today, I think we owe some credit back to Jack for really kicking things off, taking home brewing and, and commercializing it. All right, so enjoy that, and as you're finishing that up, we're going to pour you some Sam Adams, too, uh, one of the Boston Beer Company's beers. Let's get that going also. And Jim, now I've been coming to the, to the GABF for seven years now, and of course I've seen you here every year, but when was your first, how long have you been doing this? Um, my first GABF was 27 years ago, so 1984. And did you get one of these crazy phone calls from Charlie, too, asking you to come uh, be involved? From Daniel Bradford. Bradford, okay. He's now he's now all about Beer Magazine, is that right? Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, his picture was up a few minutes ago. Okay. Um, so how, tell me a little bit about how the, the beer industry and, and, as a result, this festival has changed in that 27 years you've been coming here, Jim. Uh, well, the beer industry has changed completely. Um, you know... When I started, and I started on the East Coast, which was slower, really, to uh, you know get started with craft beer than the West Coast. Uh, I mean, it was just completely different. Nobody could even understand the idea of you know quality American beer. It was an oxymoron to people. The, the beer landscape, you know, in the early '80s was the mass-produced domestic beers, which, you know, are clean, they're well-brewed for what they are, they're consistent, they're inexpensive, but they're like fast food. Nobody thinks you're going to get great beer when you're there. And then, particularly on the East Coast, the imports. And uh, that was what was considered good beer, even though it was often skunky and typically stale. And the idea of quality American beer uh, was just confusing to people and you know they didn't know where to put you on the shelf they I mean we had to convince people that American brewers could make good beer and you had to listen to this stupid joke that I heard again and again which is why is American beer like making love in a canoe anybody know yeah you know all right why is American beer like making love in a canoe because it's effing close to water. And but now we expect nothing less than high quality American beer. Well, here. now it is completely changed. The center of gravity of the world's beer culture has migrated to the craft brewers in the United States. This is the best place in the world to be a brewer and a beer drinker, and that's what's changed. Wow. Yeah, that gave me chills, Jim. That's a good... Uh, you're right, though. It is all right here, and the rest of the world's looking to us uh, for, for how it's happening. Now, more than that, this place right here at the GABF, at this moment, has more beers than have ever been brought together in one place in human history. Tonight. That's pretty cool. Take that, folks at home. <laughs> Now, uh, we're pouring uh, Boston Beer Company beer now. Do you want to tell us about that, uh, Jim? I think it's the, uh, uh, I believe it's I grabbed one. a bottle. I don't know if anybody else got some. It's the Boston Lager. That's what I think they're pouring, right, Robin? Yep. So tell us about how this beer uh, came about, Jim. In a, in a land where there was no uh, high-quality American beer like you're talking about, here comes Boston Lager. Um, well, Boston Lager, I would love to tell you what a great brewer I am and how I invented it. Um, but... Uh, you know, it, and how smart and wonderful I am. None of it's true. Um, 
my I'm the sixth oldest son in a row in my family to be a brewmaster. So uh, I come from a long line of relatively unsuccessful brewmasters. Um, this is the beer that my great great grandfather made in his brewery in St. Louis from the 1860s till the 1880s because there was a time when American beer was not considered effing close to water. There was a time when American beers were winning medals all over the world, just like today, and nobody looked down their nose at them. And a, a number of the technical innovations came from the United States. So this is basically what American beer tasted like 140 years ago. So before, just before Charlie was born? Well, right after. <laughs> just after, right around that, that period of time. I was just going to say, Jim, you made the comment there that the East Coast was a little slower. There actually was some pretty great beers brewed on the East Coast up until, um, you know, Ballantine's India Pale Ale was one that was... Uh, Prior Double Dark. Yeah, that was a, a wonderful beer that I was able to sample when I was young. So it wasn't that many years ago. And actually, the East Coast had a had a, a lasting, you know, interesting beer culture uh, probably later than anywhere else in the U.S. That's yeah, right. it did. Uh, I you know, if you look at my, the festival program, my introductory letter, at Welcome to the Festival, I kind of uh, revisit some of the some of the memorable beers at the 1982 festival that I recall that were distinctive. Uh, some Narragansett Porter brewed; it had an amazing Cascade hop aroma back in 1982. It blew, that blew me away. And also, Ballantine IPA was really a great IPA and very dry. It was had to be dry hopped. I don't know how else they would have gotten those days. Uh, they, they actually had a, uh, again, innovation. They had a hop still, and they would distill uh, bullion hops uh, right in the brewery and add the oil back to the to the beer. So they were uh, sort of uh, pretty innovative for their time. And if you find some of the really old collector's items, they'd actually say age one year in wood on some of the batches. So, I mean, they were uh, doing back then what some of the craft brewers have really picked up on today. Now, speaking of hops, Ken, you're kind of renowned and known for, you know, the, the legend of Sierra Nevada Pale Ale is that it was our original hoppy beer. You know, when it came out, it kind of blew our minds in, in terms of, of hop flavor and bitterness. Well, how about now, uh, 30 years later, when you walk around the floor of the GABF, uh, what do you think about hops? Um, I still think a lot about hops, um, and today there's such a wide range of really great hoppy beers out there. Um, brewers back in, uh, in the 1970s or 80s when we started didn't have a lot of hop choices. We really had just a few to select from. And there was Bullion's, the one I mentioned, Brewer's Gold, Northern Brewer, uh, Cascade was a fairly new entrant into the marketplace, and Cluster, and that was about all you could brew with. Today we've got hops that are three times the bitterness levels and three times the oil uh, quantity levels of those hops, so you can really put uh, a very impactful hop spin on, on beers today. But when we came out with our Pale Ale at 37 bitterness units back in 1980, um, it was definitely one that would divide the, the men from the boys as far as the, uh, the appreciation from hops. So uh, it was a very hoppy beer for its time, and, and uh, you either loved it or you hated it as far as uh, uh, people who are used to drinking uh, you know, more pedestrian lager beers. So it was a, a divisive beer, and, and luckily we got a, a strong following that was able to support that uh, hoppy trend, and it's grown ever since. It was my gateway drug, I'll tell you that. Beer, I'm sorry, my gateway beer. Uh, but it's turned into sort of an addiction, great beer. But it was, Sierra Nevada was the one that turned me around. Well, thank you. Well, le and let's talk about kind of that evolution of beer, Charlie, because you must have seen a lot of different trends come and go and beer evolve. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about how the beer is today compared to when you started this whole thing? Well, when we started this whole thing, a lot of the... Uh, tradition that was embraced by the early small craft brewers were ales, and particularly English ales. So most brewers were coming out with their version of English pale ale, English stout, porter, um, and that was pretty ubiquitous. Boulder beer started out that way in, in Boulder. and uh, But a lot of the ingredients that were available to the English brewers were not available in this country, like the English hops and the, the, maybe the the, ye the yeast that they were using and the malts they were using. So all of a sudden you had brewers that were making porters and stouts and English ales and and 
English style beers with American ingredients, American hops, and winging it. The same thing was true with when the first wheat beers came out. People had gone over to Europe, or Germany in particular, and loved the Hefeweizen. They came over and they figured, well, it's almost impossible to get the Hefeweizen yeast. Just going to make it with our house ale yeast. And voila, American style wheat beer was born. It was basically the ingredients, but the yeast was was what you could get in those By days. By necessity, sure. Yeah. yeah. So that's that was, you know, there weren't a whole lot of lager traditions. I mean, Jim was one of the first. Well, Jim Schluter as well from River City. He was a he was a a, mic, a, a micro brewer from Sacramento, and he had some great delicious. He had a dark dark lager and a golden a golden lager that was really quite nicely brewed. Yeah, J Jim Schluter started about when we did, and he would come up. Uh, he was even smaller than us and would buy malt from me, and he kept uh, telling us and, and anybody would listen how. Ales are dead. The Sierra Nevada is going to fail. Uh, lagers, the future of, uh, of craft beer. So um, he went out of business a couple years later. Uh, yeah, Tim didn't laugh. Well, I know he did. If, if you're in the business of brewing, brewing, you know that you, if you're going to make a uh, thousand barrels of beer a year in in an area that has this amount of real estate. If you want to make a thousand barrels of lager, you're going to need four times its real estate because it takes that much longer to kind of turn the beer around. So, ales were were convenient, and it was it was tough in those days to make thing make ends meet, not only from the brewery and but from the association and the beer festival and trying to get people to come to the first beer festivals. Whew, I mean. You had to drag them kicking. Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Now, can we talk a little bit about home brewing too? Because I think it's a big part of this evolution of craft beer. In my opinion, we interview at the Brewing Network lots of, of professional brewers all year long. And it is extremely rare that I find a founder of a beer company or a head brewer that didn't start as a home brewer. And I feel like home brewing has really pushed the country to where we are today in craft beer because of the experimentation and the love of beer, wanting to go further and become a professional. And Charlie, having started the Home Brewers Association, I think you must have really seen well, this. Well, let me just briefly say, I, it's obviously the foundation of what, what this festival is, and it's also going to be it's the future. If we don't have new people coming in as, as brewers, um, it, it won't be as exciting for us 30 years from now at the 60th Great American Beer Festival. Well, Jim, you have a, a homebrew competition through your company every year. Yeah, and there's a good reason for that because, you know, when the beer festival started, as, as Charlie and Ken said, it was really, we were just part of the homebrewers convention. It was you know, the Friday night, Saturday night event uh, that was tagged on to the AHA uh, because there wasn't really uh, a huge supportive community for craft brewers back then. It was the home brewers where you could feel comfortable and feel understood and feel, you know, welcome. Uh, and then you'd go out into the real world and have to deal with distributors who didn't want your beer and retailers that thought it was too expensive. But with home brewers, you know, you felt good. And even today, I mean, I read Zymergy every month, and I learn something. And because there are, uh, home brewing to me is like the roots of the craft brewing movement. You don't see it, but without that energy, uh, we wouldn't have the craft beer movement that you see today. And Ken, if I'm not mistaken, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale started as a beer in, in your garage on your home brewery. Uh, yeah, actually I started home brewing in 1969, um, back before there was a, a Zymer G or really any information. And I, uh, I purchased Fred Eckhart's book in 1970, right when he published it. And it was uh, the first book written by an American for making quality American home brew. Up until then, it was either all British books on how to make inexpensive homebrew or uh, basically the Blue Ribbon Blueing, Brewing School, which was just lots of sugar and uh, lots of uh, alcohol was the goal. So it was really the, the first book that showed that there's great beer styles brewed around the world and you can brew them at home. Um, I then opened a homebrew supply shop in 1976 and 
Um, you know, that's right at the infancy of when craft beer was really just starting to come along. You're in the right place at the right time. It's a, it's a, a great story that Sierra Nevada has. I don't. I, I think we're running uh, out of time a little bit, but I know that we poured a second Sierra Nevada beer too. That should be going around now. All right. This was our grand crew. So this was the culmination of our 30th anniversary. We did a beer with Fritz Maytag, and we did the one with Jack, um, and we did our, our grand crew, which uh, is a blend of our um, pale ale, our celebration ale, and, and barrel aged Bigfoot. So it was a, a combination of of the beers that uh, part of what made us famous. And then we're going to pour. We can go ahead and do that, too. Uh, we've got Boston Beer Company's Triple uh, to pour today, too. So let's get that going. And, Charlie, so in, in 30 years, I know in, in my this is my seventh, and I've had, uh, I have so many memories. A lot of them are fuzzy, but so many good memories. But in 30 years, can you tell me, do you have anything in mind, any stories you can think about, like some fond moments for us? Before, I actually I left out the, we did a, an event last year, Charlie and I, because we did a beer with Charlie and Jack. So uh, I, I left that out of the lineup, so I apologize. <laughs> Okay. More for me later. Yeah. Um, yes, um, there are a lot of great memories of the beer festival, but in the early years, you know, after the fifth or sixth beer festival, seventh beer festival, I can remember brewers coming up to me and thanking me and the association for putting on the beer festival. And you got to remember that. Not all breweries were fond, per, fond of, the, of the Great American Beer Festival when, when we started. There were a lot that didn't participate or wouldn't participate for one reason or another. One of the common reasons was, well, Denver is in the middle of the country and I'm brewing a thousand miles away. Why would I want to send my beer to Colorado? I you know, it's, it's, I'm just like throwing money away. And, you know, the idea of the beer festival was to put on stage, a national stage, and it took us decades to do get to that point, but the, the idea was to put craft beer, microbrewed beer, call it whatever you want, good beer, on stage, American made. And the point that these people were making that were kind of really kept us all going was that they said, you know, it's so damn hard to tell people what's going on here in Colorado. It's so damn hard to sell my beer. It's so hard to convince distributors to take my beer. It's so hard to get people to go from what they're drinking to something different. It's, it, and I come here and I get so inspired. I get my batteries recharged and I go home and I know I just got to try harder. And that's that was one of the point, major points of what the Great American Beer Festival accomplished for a lot of people that are still in business is that it was damn hard in a lot of this country. And in those days, Denver was kind of a hub. You know, we had the Great American Beer Festival. We got a little bit more publicity than most other parts, but they got recharged and inspired to keep plugging away and keep financing and putting their homes <laughs> putting themselves in more debt to keep trying to make it work because this was the community that was their support. They weren't getting that support at home. Well, that's success already because uh, the community grew because of that. That's wonderful. How about you, Jim? Uh, you've been coming now for a long time, too. You got any fond memories? First medal, maybe? Mm -hmm. That was nice, but, <laughs> um, you know, actually, uh, one of the things I remember from the GABF uh, that made me feel uh, that same sense of community that Charlie's talking about. Remember when Bill Coors showed up? Oh, 1985. 85. Um, you know, and, and here was this collection of basically hippies and, you know, <laughs> outcasts and people at the fringe of the world. And, you know, but Bill Coors showed up and talked to us. And that made me feel just this sense of community that even with his weird politics and odd political notions that we were all brought, and huge company, we were all brought together as brewers. And there he was in this crappy hotel, the, the Regency, which is now student housing. That's how bad it was. And Bill Coors came and talked to, maybe there were 20 of us, uh, there and I thought, wow, uh, we are part of a community, and this is a role model 
for all of us. He doesn't need to be here, but here he is. Oh, that's fantastic. That's a good story. I'm going to ask Ken the same, but let me let you guys know we'll, we have a few minutes for questions. There's a microphone right here. So if anybody has any, you can just kind of line up next to the mic there or behind it, and we'll, get, we'll let you ask these guys some questions. And Justin, before we, I just want to thank two people who were important in the beer festival. Jim Homer, who ran the first judging. You're talking about the first medal. Oh, yeah. I do remember that, but it was yeah. Jim who did all the judging and got you, all Jim. the beers to us judges fresh and actually correctly marked. Thank you, Jim. And Daniel Bradford, who Charlie talked about, who has showed up here. Cheers. Dan is great, too. All about Beer Magazine. Uh, you can still find Daniel's work. So, all right, how about you, Ken? 30 years. Uh, well, I mean, the very first GABF was in a room about as big as this space, maybe a little larger, and it was absolutely packed. And, uh, you know, we were shocked. Again, we had never been to anything like that or to anything like that. But I remember the, the few years after, there was some fairly, uh, oh, they're hilarious now, probably weren't hilarious at the time, where ice chests and beer were dripping through the floor from uh, uh, where the beer festival was above into a, um, a, a young uh, girl's beauty pageant. And so dripping through the ceiling and uh, having people come up and scream at us. Um, <laughs> I think that ended our, our use of that hotel, I think, at that point. Oops. I, I want to mention another, another thought that I just had. You see all these long lines at the beer festival. Well, the original first long line was in 1984 that when we moved the festival from Boulder to Denver to Kurrigan Hall briefly for one, one year. And the longest line was at Burt Grant's Yakima Breweries booth and he was introducing his Grant's Imperial Stout which was this black stout that was highly hopped and no one had ever experienced anything like it and all the more traditional beer people from the industry were they were scratching their heads and they couldn't figure out why these people were drinking this motor oil and the, it, was the, it was the hit of the festival I mean that was the original long line that I can think of. I can think also, in 83, there was somewhat of a line at Red Hook when they first introduced in 83 Red Hook, which was then kind of a, I don't know, what they kind of admitted to was kind of funky. They call it Belgian style, but it was a beer that had a lot of things going on besides yeast. It was in fact, you can say that. <laughs> but there was a long line, and the thing was, it was interesting and it was different, and people wanted something different, and there was a long line for that one too. So some of those original long lines go way back. Well, and it just really exemplifies our hunger as, as beer fans and consumers for something different, something new, and those are the same long lines we see today. It's the one that's kind of out there, peanut butter beer or whatever it might be. All right, let's do a couple questions before we got to go. Um, go ahead. All right, thanks so much. Uh, Charlie talked about, you know, going to the British Beer Festival, and, and Jim talked about how we've got more beers here than we've had anywhere in the world in human history. Certainly American craft beer is centered more around creativity than history. You know, I was just at the Tour de Goose back in May, you know, wonderful celebration of Belgian history. Here it's much more about creativity, and I wonder if you guys could, knowing what you know about the world's beers, comment about how different it is America's based on that creativity. You know, um, yes, and that changed somewhere in the 90s because, uh, the, uh, this is my point of view, but the origins of craft brewing back in the 80s into the early 90s were largely about recreating European styles of beer here in the United States. And then with twists and maybe you know, different hops, there's some twist on it, but typically bringing back uh, styles of beer, which in many cases had died out in the old world. I mean, Ken's Porter, for example, there was hardly any porters left in England when you were brewing porter here, and America is sort of the Noah's Ark of many of these traditional styles. Sometime in the 90s, it flipped, and today, you know, American craft brewing is characterized by this incredible explosion of creativity. Again, the kind of thing that happens in history very rarely. It happened in Central Europe in the 1840s when many of the 
things like Pilsner and Dunkel and Hellas were born. Yeah. Uh, and it only happens in bursts. So enjoy it now. It yeah. won't last. The first, I can think of the first original extreme beers were honey beers, raspberry wheat beers, fruit beers, beers with spices in it. Those were the original, very, very way out there extreme beers, if you can imagine. I'll also add that uh, a lot of the uh, conventions of brewing in Europe have actually stymied their industry significantly. Uh, you know, in Germany, the focus is brewing pretty much, you know, had been one style of lager beer, which kept getting a little more and more homogenized every year. And they really had laws precluding them from experimenting and going out and, and doing, even dry hopping wasn't isn't really legal if you take a strict interpretation of the German purity laws. So Americans really have, have pushed those boundaries and have introduced or reintroduced uh, a lot of the Europeans to what great brewing traditions that uh, you know we've had and been to develop based on theirs. So uh, they're taking notes now from what's happening in the U.S. But if we make them really quick, we can do a couple more questions. All right. Definitely, uh, gentlemen, just wanted to say thank you all for spending some time with us. We certainly appreciate that. Uh, my question is actually sort of based on what Ken just said. Uh, since the explosion of the craft brew movement, what do you feel either from a technology standpoint or a marketing standpoint, whatever, has been the most important or interesting innovation that's come along in the craft brew movement? Well, again, I think uh, people like Vinny at Russian River and, and uh, other brewers, uh, modern brewers, who have really pushed the boundaries and have, again, either introduced new styles or, or adapted old styles and made them more interesting again. So I think the, the craft brewers not having a fear about experimenting uh, has really brought a lot back to the brewing industry on a global basis. There's uh, exciting beer things happening uh, all around the world in you know, China and Japan and Brazil and, and uh, Italy and uh, you name it, there are now new beer cultures springing up in a, a major part because of what craft beer has done for the world of beer. Vinny might actually be the greatest innovation in craft beer in the last 20 years. Vinny himself might be there. <laughs> no, Natalie's doing Natalie. pretty it's, well with her innovation. <laughs> Quick question? Uh, if each of you had uh, time in your life to brew one final beer, what would it be? Say that again, if we could drink one? If you could brew one Ooh. final beer. Only one kind? Yes. Oh, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> did, did a Bad question. Next question. Oh, you know, I know we're going to run out of time real quick, but if you don't know about it yet, right back of the hall is a footprint, 5,000 square foot walled off area duplicating what it was like in 1982. 1982 pavilion, the beers that were served in 1982 are being served in that pavilion. The footprint, the space is the exact square footage of the original Great American Beer Festival and there's a lot of photographs around there so make your make your way back there and check it out. It all fits in the restroom area. That's, right. That's how small the footprint is. It's right there. One more quick question. All right. Good thing it's a good one. Uh, we talk, you guys are talking about the past, and yeah, that's great and all, but there's a lot of ambitious young homebrewers here, a lot of people that have you know, been taken by storm on this, and uh, do you at all foresee the, the beer culture of this country and maybe the world changing at all from the big dominated brewing companies to smaller, back to the, what you were talking about with the 1860s, back to the original roots of a small local brewery in a neighborhood being, that's the beer. Do you see that happening, or do you see it? Absolutely. Why do you think we're here? I mean, if we thought that InBev and the South Africans were going to take over the world, we wouldn't be here. Absolutely. That's what you know. People like Ken and I have been doing for decades. Okay. That's about all the time we have. I got. I just. If it's real quick, come on, go for it. You probably had a lot of them, but what's your favorite style right now? Right now. Another bad Whatever question. that is. <laughs> Whatever's in the hand. Whatever, we always get it. Whatever's in my hand. <laughs> All right. So I, I want to, you know, we've been celebrating 30 years up here with, uh, with Jim and Charlie and Ken. But I would just like us to toast to 30 more years because I think it's really getting bigger and better. The, beer's the future getting bigger and better. will be way better than the past. There we go. So cheers to 30 more years of the Great American Beer Festival. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much, guys, for your beer, for sharing your time and your stories with us. We really appreciate it. As a beer fan, I just can't thank you enough. So thank you, guys. Thanks. All right.
You can watch a video of this on uh, the Brewing Network if you want to. And we got more panels coming up. We've got the Italian beer connection coming up next. And then later tonight, we're doing a champion brewery tasting. All the champion breweries from last year. So stick around. Come get yourself served some beer. Thank you for spending time with us.